Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> the Garden of Eden was a wonderful place that God had created, a paradise eastward in Eden, which allowed men and women, as they were first formed, to begin to learn very important things about life. First, they could, they could see the natural order that God had created with the animals that he had there. And they could learn about the things of God because every, every evening they had the opportunity to meet with angels and to learn about divine things. So it was a marvellous start for the human race, but sadly things went wrong. And I suppose you could uh, say that two questions are immediately brought to mind when you begin to read these early chapters, as we were just reading chapter 3. The first is, why was it that God introduced a law into the Garden of Eden? Why did he not just leave everybody to their own devices and not worry unduly about how people responded and what they did? And the answer is, of course, that man had been formed, man and woman had been formed in the image and likeness of Almighty God. They had, in other words, the possibility of reflecting divine things in the way that they thought and then in the way that they acted. But how were they to respond to it? Well, of course, they could have conversations with the angels and they could express to the angels their appreciation of everything that God had done and had gifted to them. But was there, an, as it were, an acid test? We've just come uh, past the time when people have been receiving their A-level results, haven't we? And uh, one of the arguments about exams is you might listen to a lot of stuff and you might appear to be taking it in, but did you actually learn anything from the tuition that you had received? And there was the opportunity. God implanted into the garden one law. Of all the trees of the garden, they could free, freely eat, except for one designated tree that was described as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And those words themselves are powerful because they immediately create a line of demarcation between what was good, which was to abstain from partaking of the fruit, and what was evil, which was to break the divine law and to eat of the forbidden fruit. So it had given man and woman an opportunity in a very practical way to demonstrate their love for God their willingness to comply with his law and that they were on God's side rather than on their own side. And unfortunately, as we were just reading, they chose to break that particular law and to eat of the forbidden fruit, putting their own desire, because the tree was an attractive tree, above the law of Almighty God. So that, that law, small though it was, in the whole scope of God's created purpose was an important element in showing were they on God's side or their side. And they, they determined on the fact that they were in fact going to do what they chose to do rather than what God had said. So that's the first question. Why was there a law? Because that law was an important component in their development and their understanding of the things of God and their ability to show that they were on God's side or their own side. But the second question that comes out is, why did God come down on them with such ferocity once that law had been broken? Why were they expelled from the garden? And why was the whole rhythm and structure of the world affected as a result of all of that. And it seems to me that there is a very clear answer there that God wanted to teach them a very powerful lesson from the very outset. He wanted them to know that breaking God's law was a desperately dangerous thing to do. And you can see that from the way that uh, Bible history unfolds. In no time at all, we find that not only was there deceit in the world, but there was murder in the world. And according to the careful chronology of these early chapters of Genesis, by the year 1656, every imagination of the thoughts of men's heart was only evil continually. And God determined, bringing the flood, that he would end that society, described as the world that then was, and would start again with just eight people, one family, and begin the whole cycle again. 
So God wanted to instill upon them the fact that sin is a very deadly and dangerous thing. In just the same way that nowadays we try to persuade people that drug addiction is something that will lead to disaster because people become addicted. And addiction is a thing that's not easy to break. And sin turns out to be the most addictive thing that there ever is. Once we choose to please ourselves, we like it so much that we like to do it again and again and again and again, which is exactly what happened in the world. So God had said to Adam and Eve that in the day they broke his law and ate of the forbidden fruit, they would begin a process of dying. Just as, as it's the afternoon and we've all had a very nice lunch, can I, uh, can I ask if anybody can remind me how long was it that Adam, and Adam lived after this particular process, assuming this was right at the early part of his life? How old was he when he died? No, he was 900 and something. As a, uh, <laughs> he was 930 years old by the time that he died. So you'll notice that God didn't bring instant or summary judgment. He wasn't dismissed immediately and his life force ended. He was allowed to continue to live in very different circumstances. But those circumstances were very different because from the time that he and Eve left the garden, they entered a more hostile world. A world that had been in total harmony with God was now a world in which they were somewhat estranged. In fact, it's uh, the Apostle Paul when he's writing in uh, uh, the letter to the Romans who says that the world became blighted by a sense of frustration or by vanity. It became under that particular direction that God had sent. And the reason was, of course, that God wanted to make it perfectly clear to people that Sin was a terrible thing, and the consequences of sin were that the world would be blighted as a result of mankind breaking God's law, which, of course, we're familiar with nowadays because that's what everybody does all the time. They don't think twice about it. They don't, for many people, they don't even believe in the existence of Almighty God, and therefore the world is careering towards self-destruction. And we can see that from the fact that people are consuming as much as they possibly can, regardless of the consequences, and our world is slithering into a situation where people are now fearful about its continued existence, at least in its existence in the way that we currently know it. So how is God to bring that aspect to mind, as far as Adam and Eve were concerned, and to impress this particular message upon the human race. And, and the answer, if you come to Genesis chapter 3 and the words we were just reading, if you, if you come to verse 21, you will see that the way that God chose to impress that idea upon mankind was this. And to Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. In other words, an animal or animals were taken out of the, the stock that God had created. And you remember this was a time when people lived in total harmony with the, the animals. And as such, one of those animals or two of those animals were taken and were brought to a place that God had ordained. And there, they were ritually killed. And you must, uh, if I can use your imagination for a moment, be Adam and Eve, although please be properly clothed, and uh, stand there for a moment watching that particular instance where you see this animal that you perhaps know, maybe it was a pet animal, you see this animal being killed, being butchered, being uh, its fleece being taken off by the angels, no doubt, and you at last are presented with um, a covering that you can put on as you head out uh, into a, a stranger world. You see that sense of, of Adam and Eve thinking, wow, was this done for me? Did I, was I the cause of that particular upset? Why, why did it have to be like this? You see, God is trying to impress upon our early parents just how awful it was that they had broken his law. It was a terrible thing. And if you now think, let your mind run through Bible history for a moment, and 
and think how that aspect is going to be taught and taught and taught again. Can anybody else think of a circumstance where, for example, an animal had to be brought into the house and, and kept in the household for a period of time until it became something of a, of a pet lamb? And in course of time, it had to be killed, its blood had to be caught, and it had to be daubed somewhere. Well, I can see just looking at you, those of you who are smiling, you know exactly what I'm thinking about. You're thinking about the Passover and the time when Israel was to be rescued out of Egypt, and yet a price was to be paid to effect their release. And when I say the animal might have been brought in to, uh, to the house and to be kept there and would become something of a pet with the children, that is exactly what used to happen in my sister's farm when, in fact, she used to bring pet lambs that had, uh, where perhaps the mother had either refused them or had, uh, had too many. And uh, often, often one would be popped into the Rayburn uh, at, a low, at a low heat, I have to say, <laughs> and, uh, and revived and then be fed with... Uh, with, with a bottle, and, uh, and that lamb would become quite friendly. In fact, Mary and I well remember walking down the field on one occasion, and while all the sheep moved away, this one particular sheep moved towards us, which we thought was rather unusual, and we, we went back and uh, said to my sister, um, there was a sheep that came towards us when we walked down the field. Oh, that's lamby, she said. That was a pet lamb that they were still very uh, friendly with. So you see that sense that the children, for example, at the time of the exodus would have felt bad about the fact that that lamb, which they'd become quite friendly with, was now to be sacrificed for their sake. The same sort of sentiment, I suspect, although perhaps somewhat watered down, that would have been when Adam and Eve saw exactly that same thing happening. An animal being killed so that they might be spared and they might be covered. Can anybody else think of another occasion where um, there, there would be a regular way of teaching this on a, I'll give you a clue, on a daily basis where a nation would be encouraged to remember what happened in Eden day after day after day? Evening and morning sacrifices, as, uh, as Daz had said. Honestly, I haven't fed him with uh, any of the answers here. He knows them all. Every morning and every evening, a lamb had to be sacrificed, first in the tabernacle and then in the temple. You see, God was impressing that message upon them day by day, evening by evening, so that Israel were never to forget that the only reason why their lives had been spared was because a lamb had been offered that had formed a covering for the sin of Adam and Eve. And when the prophets came to, to talk about these things, the prophets also picked up on this very theme. Anybody remember a prophet who said anything about a lamb that would play an important part in the purpose of God? I'm looking at you, Daz, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm available <laughs> for any of you who, who might have a thought. Well, you'll, you'll know it well as soon as I mention it. You remember in the... Sorry? In Isaiah. Remember those four servant songs in Isaiah, uh, starting in chapter 42 and ending in chapter 53? Well, just have a look. Isaiah chapter 53. Just remind yourself, although you know it well where we read about the fact then that one would come who would be a perfect servant, who would offer his life as a sacrifice, because that's what Isaiah 53 is talking about. And what does it say of him? There at verse 7, it uses this very language, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, Isaiah 53 and verse 7, yet he opened not his mouth, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And it goes on, of course, in very considerable detail to describe the fact that this one who would come, the perfect servant of God, the one who would now obey in all aspects, would lay down his life. There's verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment, 
And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the Lamb of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Although the record says in verse 9 that he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And he would make his offering, his life, says verse 10, an offering for sin. So Isaiah was painting a picture in the clearest possible terms of one who would come who was like a lamb. And who was it in the New Testament who then declared, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Thank you, Daz. Uh, D D Daz is getting gold stars here, right, left and centre, but I, I know the rest of you just a little shy, but you know the answers perfectly well. And, uh, and th that is the situation. You remember in that, in that situation where John is introducing the Lord Jesus to his disciples in John chapter 1, he says some remarkable things there. He says that I didn't know who he was when he came to be baptised. He says two or three times in John chapter 1, I, I didn't know him. Which, uh, which just indicates that Jesus and John had not had a lot of social intercourse during the course of their uh, early lives. And John had been in the wilderness anyway and perhaps had not been coming regularly to the, uh, to the various feasts in the temple. Um, but uh, he said, when I saw the Spirit coming down upon him, then I realized that he was the Son of God. And in order to encourage his, his then disciples to go to the Lord Jesus instead, he says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So you get that very same theme. Notice how a theme that had begun in the book of Genesis is right there through the Bible, but there's, there's one little issue that we haven't touched on, and that is, who said it was a lamb? It didn't tell us that back in the Genesis 3 accounts, did it? How do we know this, this was a lamb or lambs that were sacrificed in the Garden of Eden? The lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Absolutely so. And uh, that we don't find that out until the book of Revelation, remember, when we are suddenly told there that that was the situation. So it was a lamb that was slain. No wonder it was constantly bring, being brought back to Israel's attention through the tabernacle offerings and the temple offerings, through the Passover, through the prophets, so that at last, of course, the New Testament can pick that theme up. And if you come for a moment to 1 Peter chapter 1, you'll see the Apostle Peter adding his witness here. And Peter had been one of the disciples of uh, John the Baptist at that uh, early time. There at verse 9 of 1 Peter chapter 1, we read, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. That doesn't quite uh, fit, fit in. Somewhere, somewhere there it says he is a, a lamb slain from the... Uh, anybody see in uh, 2 Peter 1, perhaps verse 9? Sorry? Oh, no, it's verse 19, sorry. 1 Peter 1, verse 19. We are not redeemed with corruptible things, verse 18, as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And you'll notice there in verse 18 how sweeping is that statement that the Apostle Peter says. You are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. And in, in that particular expression, he dismisses everything that is material in the world, the thing that people strive for, the people live their lives longing for. Silver and gold, corruptible things, he says. You are not redeemed with such things. You couldn't buy the things that were done, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. So you see that when God ordained his holy purpose, he was determined then to impress upon mankind that whilst he had created a world in which we can all live, which we can all enjoy, 
He wanted man and woman to obey the laws that he had given, to listen to his voice, to walk in his way. And if they didn't, then the clearest possible message was that they would go badly wrong if they chose to do their own thing and go their own way. And so the whole principle that God had instituted, which involved a tabernacle and a temple and sacrifice, was designed to teach us that sin is the most terrible thing in the world and that we should not go that way because it is so addictive that once we begin to do those things, we will want to do them more and more and more, and the more we do them, the further away we get from the things that God would have us do. So if we wanted a clear demonstration of how awful sin is, where would we look? Well, we've already thought about certain aspects. We've thought about the fact that God had to bring an entire society to an end because of the exceeding sinfulness of men. Every imagination of the thoughts of men's hearts was only evil continually, and God said, enough, and began again with a new society. And if we now look at our society, which, if you like, is the second of God's societies, are we not in exactly the same situation now, where God must look at our world and think, our world has so far strayed from what he had asked us to do that we are right on the very edge of removal once more, this society being collapsed and a new society yet beginning. So... What God had sought to teach us was that sin is the most terrible thing in the world. And the Apostle Paul says that. He says that the law was given so that sin might be seen to be exceedingly sinful. In a way, that's a, that's a funny sort of sentence, but it's a sentence in Romans chapter 7. The law was given so that we could see that sin is exceedingly sinful. In other words, so that God would say, look, don't touch it because it's desperately dangerous. But God wanted to teach that lesson in another way. And that way was the way that we were thinking about this morning during our exhortation. He sent his son into the world who lived a blameless life. Three times the scripture says, he did no sin. No guile was found in his mouth. He was a man who lived a perfect life. He could say, when he was asked of his disciples, he that has seen me has seen the Father. What we were told is that he was the perfect demonstration of the Father in the way that he lived. His was a remarkable life. It's the Apostle Peter who sums up his life in just a few words where he says, he went about doing good. Wouldn't we all like that as an epitaph on our tombstones if we ever get there? He went about doing good. And that, that was the life of the Lord Jesus. He was a light who shone in the world. And men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And so that light was quenched. And when it pleased God to allow his son to die a sacrificial death, he did it in a way that showed for all the world how desperately terrible sin is. He allowed him to be crucified and to be hung there outside the walls of Jerusalem for men and women to come and look at him. And we were reading, weren't we, from the Mark account just how it was that they came. They came to jeer at him. They came to joke at him. He saved others, himself he cannot save. The Apostle Paul writing to Galatians says that Christ was placarded before us, crucified. That's how the Greek reads. Placarded, as though it was a poster, a billboard that was held up for all the world to see. This is what you have done to a perfect and an upright man. This is how terrible sin is. That was what the scripture was designed to say 
and to show. So the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is the clearest visible demonstration of the awfulness of sin. We have seen it already in the lamb that was sacrificed, in the life that was given, in the sacrifices that were offered day and evening, in the way that the prophets had foretold it, in the way that the apostle can brush aside silver and gold as corruptible things and show that it was the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot and blameless that has rescued and redeemed mankind. And of course the Apostle Paul goes on to argue that we can associate ourselves with what was done in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not all bad news because this is a remarkable thing that that placard that was holding up for all mankind to see saying Sin is the most terrible thing in the world. Actually also said, and love is the most wonderful thing in the world. Because, of course, the scripture says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And the Lord Jesus said, describing himself as the shepherd of the sheep, not just the lamb, but also the shepherd, he says, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it again. This was a voluntary act. Nobody took the life of the Lord Jesus Christ from him. He laid it down. No man takes my life, he said. I have power to lay it down. It was a voluntary act in which the Lord Jesus gave his life to teach us profound lessons, first about sin and the awfulness of sin, and also about salvation, that this was the God-appointed way in which our sin could be forgiven and our sin could be covered. And that's why, of course, the New Testament holds out the idea that when we associate ourselves with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we become part of that process of salvation. Let me take you for a moment to, to Romans chapter 6, so you know these words well, where the apostle is talking about that association. And he says there in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, he says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We associate ourselves with the death of the Lord Jesus in our baptism. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So you see that sense there that the apostle is saying that Christ died to give us an opportunity to associate ourselves with his death and therefore with his resurrection by the act of baptism. Just as God had given Adam and Eve a law which enabled them to say, we are on your side, and we are going to do what you ask of us. So baptism does exactly the same for us. Gives us the opportunity to associate with the things that God has asked of us. <clears throat> and of course in the process of baptism you must remember that, well you know full well, that Romans chapter 6 is the sixth chapter in a logical development of thought where the apostle starts in Romans chapter 1 by saying how astray the world is and how God has closed his eyes on the things that are going on God has given them up and they are therefore working towards their own destruction and then the apostle starts to say we're all in the critical situation where we're all sinners we're all in desperate need of salvation Romans chapter 3 remember is the longest chain of Old Testament scriptures in the whole of the New Testament where he pulls verses largely out of the Psalms to say that every mouth might be shut and all the world might become <clears throat> guilty before God. <clears throat> and then he says, but God was right in what he did when he condemned sin. And in our baptisms, we accept the rightness of God 
and say, we don't want to go our own way, we want to go your way. Well, of course, there are many aspects to the reason why the Lord Jesus died, but I want to take you back to, to one other, and that was back in the, the Genesis 3 account, where, in fact, we read about the, the sacrifice of this animal or these animals. Difficult to know whether the lamb was big enough to provide two garments for Adam and Eve, and we don't really know how big those garments were, do we? Were they, were they just a, a covering for their, their middle, or, or was it a, a full coat that they had to wear? But you'll, you'll notice the record says there, and to Adam also and to his wife, this is Genesis 3 and verse 21, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them? And this begins another Bible long theme, the idea of covering. You might remember that when Noah and his seven of the family were in the ark, it had to be carefully uh, covered. The, uh, the, the wooden structure had to be covered with a creosote or bitumen covering. You have that idea of something that would cover and would protect in the covering. Can anybody else think of any other occasions where this idea of covering was actually um, worked out in Israel's history? Well, you had to have that idea that you could not go into the presence of God as you were, but instead you had to be in some way masked. Sorry? The priests, the priests who had to wear linen garments, remember? And the high priest who had to wear garments which were for glory and for beauty. Quite clearly there we have that sense of, of people having to cover themselves in, as it were, their, their, native, their naked human form so that they might go into the service of God. This idea of covering was, was absolutely critical. And the scripture then talks about forgiveness of sins as a covering where we are, as it were, protected from the wrath that would otherwise come upon us. And I take you to, to Psalm 32, for example, where, the, uh, where King David, in, in a very difficult situation, has broken many of the laws of God and is in a situation where he really should have been um, killed, he should have been executed, but in fact God was willing to forgive him his sin. And when he wrote these two psalms, 32 and 51, which were psalms that were going to be sung in the, the Christian con in, in the um, congregation of Israel, you imagine that situation. You come in and you look at the hymn board and you say, oh, somebody's chosen Psalm 31. Oh, good. And, and you, you realize then that your own errors are going to be paraded again in, in, in the temple service. And this is what you would be singing, or the choir would be singing. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. And you'll notice there that the whole range of human misbehavior is articulated. Transgression, sin, and iniquity all of which carry different little colours or, or, or connotations. And now the, David can say, Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. So you have that idea of the covering of their sins. And of course, intriguingly, the Apostle Paul, writing in Romans, working his way through, remember, towards Romans chapter 6, brings into his equation David and says, there's a man who's had his sins forgiven. You know, and you think, of, of all the people that he might have uh, brought into the frame, you wouldn't naturally have thought of David. I mean, David was a, a, an adulterer. David was a murderer, as Nathan had said. You've taken away his life. Uh, David was a person who had broken law after law, and yet he is here forgiven because his sin is covered. And the, 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 the prophet's also use the very same language where they talk about our own condition as being nothing but filthy rags. We are in tatters as far as the, uh, the, the righteous look of God is concerned. If we trust in our own behavior, in our own abilities, then unfortunately we would be anything but covered. 
It's Isaiah, for example, who talks about how righteousness is like filthy rags. The prophet Zechariah talks about the fact that we saw the high priest and the high priest's garments were filthy and had to be replaced. So you see the sense there in which the scriptures way back from the Garden of Eden, pick out these two aspects, and they're the only two aspects we're looking at this afternoon. The first being that sin is a terrible thing and that a lamb had to be slain in order for that sin to be forgiven. And uh, that was how the Lord Jesus was like a lamb. He, he acted in a perfectly innocent and harmless and righteous way all through his life. And he laid down that life of his own volition. He laid it down. And the second thing that we've been looking at is that there was a covering made <coughs> excuse me, in the Garden of Eden because of the lamb or lambs that had been slain. And that that covering is again articulated in many different places. As here, David's sin was covered as though God would no longer look upon it because he had masked it because of his grace and his mercy and the last picture of all for us to think about is an occasion when the apostle john was being shown uh, about the purpose of god and was seeing it in pictorial terms and on this one occasion he hears a recitation of of many um, people being described and they come from a variety of different places and they are catalogued as belonging to different tribes of the nation of Israel and and then he looks and he sees and there is a multitude of people there and he sees that all these people are wearing white robes and he says to the angel or the angel says to him in the first instance what do you know about these and he says so you know and the angel says these are they that have come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And you know, when you think about that, it's in Revelation chapter 7. When you think about that, you think that is a complete contradiction in terms. And yet, because we are, f are familiar with these scriptural themes, we can understand it. They are wearing white garments, and yet, says the angel, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. And you think, well, if you were to take a white garment and, and wash it in the blood of the lamb, I'm afraid you'd have a red garment and you, you'd be hard put to get rid of that red garment. Even if you washed and washed and washed it, you'd have a pink garment, I suspect. Certainly it would not be what might be described as a clear white garment. But there it is in verse 14. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun lighten them, nor any heat. For the Lamb, and we're going to read the revised version now, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall be their shepherd. You see how the, the whole thing begins to fit together now. This was the lamb that laid down his life so that men and women like us might have their sins forgiven. And when God looks upon us then, because we have associated ourselves with the death of the Lord Jesus, he sees us as though we were wearing white garments, garments that have been washed in the blood of the lamb. And the lamb... The Lamb is now our shepherd, sitting at the right hand of God in heaven and coming again to, to rule his people. The Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall be their shepherd and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So the wonderful purpose of God then is designed to teach us powerful things that sin is the most deadly and terrible thing that we can ever be associated with. But the love of God is such that God reaches out to fallen mankind like us and makes it possible for us to find a way of salvation through the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus, who laid down his life. We were not redeemed with corruptible things, remember, as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot and blameless, 
And when we chose to associate ourselves with him in the waters of baptism, it was so that the lamb can shepherd us into eternal life.